And here we are at the practice exam. And why don't I scroll through it slowly so that you can see it? Although I think it's in the same order as your practice exam. In fact, I know it is because I was on your site, your, your My Math Lab site, and that's where I printed it off. So it's in the same order as the problems on, on uh, your practice exam, or it certainly should be. So here's the first one. There's the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. Notice you have problems that are alike. On the exam, they're going to be pooled together and then the computer picks them at random. So for instance, problems that are alike, like all of these might be, see one, two, three, four, all of these might be pooled together, these four, and then when the computer sees, okay, now, I want a factoring problem, it'll pick one of these and give them to you. So you could receive any one of these four problems. That's the way pooling works. There are going to be 25 problems on the exam. There are 30 problems here, so obviously you will encounter almost every problem. Now I know I pooled these three problems. At least I think I did. So you'll get one of these. And yeah, yeah, these are all problems that were in your homework. So that's kind of the order of operations of doing this. I, um, I get the problems from your homework and create the practice exam and then I take the problems on the practice exam and create the real exam. So this is the source, the practice exam is, of all of the problems that are going to be on your exam. And the homework is the big source. So if it's not in the homework, you definitely won't see it on the exam. But if it's not in the practice exam, you definitely won't see it on the real exam. So we're going through these and going through these. And then we hit the answers. So I leave it up to you. There, there are doubtless some people who are prepared. Whoever has the first question to ask, please feel free. If not, I'll just start with number one. There were some things at the end of the pre-exam that looked sort of different to me that I don't recognize. Okay. These? Let's see. Um, yes, these are from the last exam. There are a few problems from exam one. That one that says is the function one to one. <clears throat> I don't uh, recognize that. Okay, we have. Oh, we haven't talked a lot about one to one. Okay. But um, uh, I have cho the answer is always going to be yes. Right now it is. And then later in the term, we're actually going to talk more about one to one, but I might as well tell you really quickly what it is. This is a quick explanation. Suppose you have a graph. Suppose you've got a graph of Y equals X to the third. Or. A straight line of some kind. Something like that. Well, there is something called the horizontal line test. Not the vertical line test, but the horizontal line test. And it, it acts the same way as the vertical line test. If this horizontal line intersects the graph at only one point, then the graph is one, two, one. 
And you're going to discover that why we care is that the only kind of graph that can have an inverse function is a one-to-one -one function. Because then you're going to be finding inverses. We have found the inverses, but we haven't talked about one-to-one, -one, but I only chose one-to-one. -one. So let's go through number 28. Let me erase this so I'll have room. Okay, what we want to do, and this is so easy, believe me, we, we have done it before. In fact, I think we did it the, the second week or even the first week. It was in a wherever, yeah, the first week or the second. We talked about reviewing functions, function behavior, what do functions do? And one of the things that most, well, that some functions do, if they're one-to-one, -one, is they have inverses. And this is how you find the inverse. Okay, so here's our function. f of x equals 9x minus 7. All that is is a straight line. This is really y equals 9x minus 7. And that actually is the next step in finding the inverse. You have to rewrite this as y equals 9x minus 7. So I'll erase it here. Now, there's this little trick you do. And I do remember talking about this. You switch the X and the Y because remember you had a problem like this. Suppose you have a function, one comma two and negative three, eight and four, five. Consisting of three non-connected points. Then the inverse, if we call this f of x, the inverse is just these points with the x's and y's reversed. Uh-uh. There. F of X and G of X are inverses, and the symbol for inverse is this. It's just a symbol. It doesn't mean do anything. It's just a symbol that means the inverse function. So you had a problem like this. You were given these points and you were asked, find the inverse. And that's how you would find the inverse. You would switch the X and Y for each point. And nothing harder than that. So let me make a little wall around this. The way you find the inverse of this is you switch the X and the Y. X equals nine Y minus seven. And then you just solve for Y, but you already know how to do this because you've been doing it. Plus seven, plus seven. So X plus seven, equals 9y, and you divide by 9, and divide by 9, okay, well, this is also a straight line. So, remember there's a 1 in front of the x, 
And so you rewrite this like you would a straight line. 1 ninth X plus 7 ninths equals Y. But that Y is F inverse of X. So you would put one ninth X plus seven ninths in here. And that is how you find the inverse of this kind of function and of this kind of function. The trick is to switch the X's and Y's and then you solve for Y. And it doesn't get any harder than that. And a whole lot of people, uh, for instance, if you have a standard form equation like 3x plus 2y equals 6, it's real normal. I mean, more than half of you go ahead and you, uh, you solve for y. Nobody tells you to, you just do it. so that you can graph it more easily. Put it into slope intercept form. Where that's the y intercept and this is the slope. So uh, this is not finding the inner inverse. This is not an inverse. But this is just the uh, this, you know, going from standard form to slope intercept form, but it's it's another example of just solving for y. So this is all you're doing here. You switch the x and the y and you solve for y and that is all there is to it. And I made sure that these are all one, all of these inverse questions are one to one. So you don't have to worry about saying well, no, it's not. There are some at the end of the semester. I'll give you examples of, of functions that are good functions, but they're not one-to-one, -one, so they don't have inverses. But that's at the end of the semester, and this is now. So they're all one-to-one -one right now. Okay, was that clear or as clear as mud. No, oh, that's good. I took down some notes. OK, good. And you'll have Thank these you. notes also. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, let me save this and then go to the next suggestion. There was a problem on the practice test where we had a parabola and it asked us to find the x-intercepts, and it, I think it was solving inequalities, and then it asked, what are the zeros? Okay, great, let me find it. Ooh, let's look here. Nope, okay. So we'll go through here, and we'll find it. Use the graph to answer the question, what are the x-intercepts and what are the zeros? Well, let's zoom in on this so that it will hopefully become more visible. Okay, this is just a look and see kind of question. You don't have to do any calculating at all. So here are the x-intercepts. So let's see what they are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is seven. And this is negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six. Okay, so now I can answer the questions. 
What are the x-intercepts? The x-intercepts are negative 6, comma, 0, and 7, comma, 0. Those are the x-intercepts. Incidentally, you're not asked for it, but the y-intercept is right here, and we would have to guess at it. So that's probably why they didn't ask. I was confused about the what is the zeros part. Aha, well, we're going to talk about that now. The zeros of the function and the x-intercepts are very, very, very closely related. If the x-intercept of a function is negative 6, 0, then the zero of the function from this x-intercept is going to be negative 6. And if an x-intercept of a function is the point 7, 0, then the zero of the function is going to be 7. So your x-intercepts are negative 6, 0 and 7, 0. And your zeros, the zeros of the function, are negative 6 and 7. That's what they are. So I'm going to erase them, and instead, I'm going to make a little arrow. That's the difference and the sameness. The X coordinate of the X intercepts are the zeros of the function. And one of the main things we're going to be doing after exam two is finding out how these guys actually generate generate this function right here. The zeros of functions, the zeros of, of, of polynomials in particular, generate the polynomials. But you don't have to know that now. All you have to do is be able to look at a graph, say what the x-intercepts are, and then say what the zeros are. Well, they're going to be that number and that number. OK. Thanks. You're welcome. Good, next question. While you're thinking, I'm going to go down here and write in here. Negative 6, comma, 0. The intercepts are points, so you write them like you would a point. And the zeros are just numbers. Don't put parentheses around them. Could we do some of the problems that have like the negative infinity and like negative five with the U? Sure. How about this? Find the domain of the rational function. Now, rational means fraction. Remember that so that you know that that is a rational function function. So fraction. And the domain is the allowable x's and where you get that is from the denominator only. And your strategy for finding the domain is to set the denominator 
equal to zero and solve for X. So we're going to do that. I'm going to take the denominator. X squared plus 3X minus 28 and set it equal to zero. And this is factorable and it's got a one in front of the X squared. So all I have to do is make parentheses and factor the number at the end, negative 28, into two numbers that add up to positive three. So that would be negative 28 equals positive seven times negative four, and seven plus negative four equals positive three. So I'll take the X squared and split it apart into X and X, and then positive seven becomes plus seven, and negative four becomes minus four, and I set each factor equal to zero and solve for X. So I subtract seven from both sides, I'll get X equals negative seven, and I'll add four to both sides, so I'll get X equals positive four, and these are the bad numbers. These are the numbers we cannot use because they make the denominator equal zero, which makes this f of x undefined. So we have to take them out of the domain. Now the domain is on the x axis always. So if I draw a little quickie x-axis here, and plot these um, on, on the x-axis about where they'd be in relation to each other. These are the numbers I have to remove from the x-axis. for this problem. And then all the rest of these numbers are okay. They're okay to use. Let me move that over a little bit. There. Okay, so this, this interval and this interval and this interval are okay, okay to use and okay to use and okay to use, which makes them the domain because the domain is really the X's you're allowed to use, the X values you're allowed to use. So, negative infinity to the left side of negative seven, unioned up with the right side of negative seven, going to the left side of positive four, make a U, and then start again at the right side of, po of positive four, and go all the way to infinity. That's your domain. In interval, let me see, interval notation. And I'll write set builder for you in a minute. I have no room. You know, you know, this is the answer box and it expands. But I'm just gonna make a little arrow. to there. 
and here. This is interval notation. If for some reason you were asked to give the domain in set builder notation, it's a lot easier. Since we're dealing with the domain, you would set it up like this. And you might have some writing in here saying things like X is a real number and, and then you would put the two numbers that we have to cast into the outer darkness, negative seven and positive four. See, we had to take them off the x-axis, we had to pluck them out. So x cannot equal, and I'm going to need more room, what a surprise, negative 7, comma, positive 4. So that would be set builder. See, all you have to write is in the answer box would be here. All you would have to do is write negative seven comma four. Is that understandable or as understandable as mud? You have to be prepared for either, but this particular question only asks for it in interval notation. So every version of this question would ask for the uh, domain in interval notation. We have a vertical asymptotes question here. Want to do that? Yes. OK, sounds good. You always have to find the domain first. No, not this one. I have to take this one out. Never mind. because we haven't talked about, that's the exception to just making these numbers. Normally you, you just make the two, the two or the one number or the three numbers, however many, that you have to take off the um, um, uh, x-axis. Those become your vertical asymptotes. But this is the exception, and we haven't talked about it enough, so I'm going to take it out and replace it with another question, which you'll see. I'm going to put another one of these questions in. So let's ignore that one. Can we go over one where we determine the horizontal, the HA with the different degrees? Yes. Let me find it. Yeah, what are these? Absolutely. Yeah, there are three of these, so one of them will be picked for you at random. Okay. Um, okay, all right. I just made sure this was not an exception. It's not. 
All right. Um, you have to find the domain before you find anything else, especially the vertical asymptotes. So you have to find the domain before you find the vertical asymptotes. So, to find the domain, we have to do what we did before. We have to take the denominator, set it equal to zero, and solve for x. But this one is really easy, right? Subtract one, subtract one. I can't even cancel out. How do you cancel out a one? I've tried different methods, like making a curve, you know, um, that's stupid. So I'm just going to say one minus one is zero, so I'm left with X on the left and negative one on the right. So this is the number I have to take off the X axis. So it, this is the number that will not be in the domain. So just so you can see it, Actually, they're not asking for the domain. So, the vertical asymptote is at x equals negative one. Oh, and then they ask the domain. That's really backwards, not the way I would ask it, but of course no one is asking me. All right, so we took the denominator. We didn't need to factor it. We set it equal to zero and solved for X, got X equals negative one. This is the equation of the vertical asymptote. However, it looks like we do need to find the domain. So let's go back and find the domain. We have room there. Let's see if we have room over here. Yes, we do. OK. This vertical asymptote, in fact, no vertical asymptote is going to be in the domain ever. So. That means if you've got your X axis. You're going to take out negative one. Meaning, all of these numbers are going to be okay, and all of these numbers are going to be okay. So, negative infinity to negative one, unioned up with negative one, the other side of negative one, to infinity. This is your domain, so all we have to do is find it down here, and here it is. So D is going to be our answer for the domain. Now we're going to find the x-intercepts and the y-intercept, and not the ha. Huh? All right, you asked specifically about the ha, but since I start, oh, here we are, this one. I should have done this one, but let me finish this as long as I started. The x-intercepts are, okay, well, they tell you here's one of them. What's the other one? Well, we're going to have to find out from scratch. So what you do to find the x-intercepts is R. Set the numerator, the top, equal to zero and solve for x. So I'm going to do that. Our numerator 
is this. X squared minus 4X plus 3. Um, X intercepts, okay. Just so I know what we're working on and just so you know what we're working on. X intercepts. Um, X squared minus 4X plus 3 equals 0. Now that is, again, I just want to be absolutely sure and want you to be absolutely sure. This is the top of the fraction, the numerator. We're setting it equal to 0 and solving for X. Boom, 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 boom. X, X, positive three factors into negative three times negative one and negative three plus negative one equals negative four. So this will factor into X minus three times X minus one. Set each factor equal to zero. and solve for x. Okay, the x, the, the x intercepts are, you have to turn them into points. Okay, we were already given this point. This is going to be the other one. So I come over here. The x-intercepts are 1, 0, and 3, 0. And then for your information, the y-intercept is what you get when you take the whole function and set it equal to zero. Well, no, you don't. I lied. You take the whole function and you set the x's equal to zero. So if we have f of x, equals x squared minus 4x plus 3 over x plus 1. Then I'm going to take each of these x's and substitute 0 for them. Oops, there was an x there. Wait a minute. That's a times. OK, everything zeroes out except the, the, the constants. The three constant up here and the one constant down here. So we're going to have three over one, which is three. But is that the x-intercept? No, because it's y that equals zero. This is y, this is x. We're finding a point. Well, that was a point, but I think it's kind of cute that the y-intercept is going to be, see, we know that x equals zero, this is x. What's in the parentheses here is always x. If it is zero, then it goes here. The answer you get is the y. So this is the y-intercept, and I'm going to put 0, 3.
OK, now. Let's ask if there are questions about this. Before we go on. Up to the previous one, one of the previous ones asks questions, asks about horizontal asymptotes. This asks for the vertical asymptote, the domain, the x-intercepts, and the y-intercept. Okay, I think it's the preceding one. Yes, right here. Well, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Let's do this. I think we can do it quickly. F of X equals negative one over X. First question, find the domain. Take the denominator, set it equal to zero, and solve for X. It's already solved. And we're going to be using interval notation. Well, all I have to do is plot zero here. Take it off the X axis. Remind myself I have infinity out here, negative infinity out here. And so all of these numbers are okay to use. And all of these numbers are okay to use. So our domain is going to be negative infinity, comma zero, parenthesis, unioned up with parenthesis, zero, comma, infinity. What is our the x-intercepts? All right, to find the x-intercepts, we set the numerator equal to zero and solve for x. The numerator is negative one. If I set negative one equal to zero, I'm going to be saying that negative one, the number negative one, equals the number zero, and that's false. There is no x to solve for Therefore, there is no x-intercept. What is the y-intercept of the function? Well, the function is f of x equals negative 1 over x. The way you find the y-intercept is you take f of x zero, that would be negative one over zero. No, 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 no. There is no y-intercept. We have a, a naked rational function. What about so, the vertical? Yes. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, so the x-intercepts, we use the numerator and set it equal to zero, and the y-intercept is the denominator. No. The y-intercept no. is f of zero. You, okay. set, you set all of the zeros. Let me go down to the previous one. Y-intercept. You, you take your f of x, and you make all of the x's equal zero, all of them, up and down. And then you calculate your answer. Here we had three. So the y-intercept was zero, three. But up here, we have an explosion. Besides, zero is not in the domain. So I can't let x equal zero. So there, there is no y-intercept either.
there's no rule that says you have to have a y-intercept. It's just that most rational functions do. Most functions do, but not all. Okay, so how do you find the x-intercept again? The x-intercept, you take the numerator, set it equal to zero, and solve for x. But that doesn't make any sense because there is no x. So you can't solve for x. So when that happens, you have no x-intercept. If all you have is a number up here with no x, that means you have no x-intercept. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.